Hello, Open Summit Japan. Welcome to this session, Bring Your Own Infrastructure, or Who Needs to Run a Control Plane Anyway? I'm Bruce Basil Matthews, and I am a member of Marantis. Uh, I have been in the industry for about 40 some odd years and uh, worked at a lot of different technology companies, including Sun Microsystems and Oracle and Hewlett Packard. And uh, when I started out, I was using Abacus and uh, slide rules to do what I do. And now fortunately it's advanced a little bit beyond that. What are we gonna talk about today? Well, I'd like to sort of start with the foundation of where we were, are, and will be, and that includes starting with where we've been, uh, and then going through some of the variations of writing applications for bare metal versus virtual machines versus containers in the world. And then um, moving on to uh, microservices and serverless computing uh, as an option. And I'd like to end that section with a important uh, section on service decomposition, because I think that as you make a transition from bare metal to VMs and containers, um, this need for decomposition comes into play. And I wanna make sure that everybody catches on with that. Um, then we're actually gonna go through the physical infrastructure elements of bare metal versus virtual machines versus containers versus a category I call who cares. And the who cares is actually um, sort of a, an outlandish thought on my part as to where we're headed uh, beyond serverless computing. Uh, I'm gonna make a case for each and how about using all four of them in any different scenario and why you might wanna do that. And then bringing in this serverless and microservices uh, environment that involves, uh, you know, libraries from, um, you know, public cloud offerings and and maybe even our own uh, as we move forward. And then how we'll add more uh, methodologies down the road to accomplish that. Um, and then I wanna go into a little bit of the mechanics of this idea of what I call who cares. It's my own flight of fancy, but neutral networking, uh, during doing a neural network of um, elements within it, uh, using trusted computing as a foundation and standardization, which I think will be the key to allowing this to get from, as you see on the right, the mainframe all the way down to the public cloud and using application code like Ballerina versus Fortran and Pascal and things like that. Okay, where we were, are, and will be, and it's a very long journey. Uh, it's gone over those 40 some odd years that I talked about earlier but we have to take that uh, journey by taking the first steps. So in the world where we have been, um, when you started off with punch cards and paper tapes and you're running down the hall to make sure you uh, push them into the, the machine uh, holding uh, stack, uh, and, and uh, don't spill any or don't get them out of sequence, and when you had to wait for the stack to pr process and the mini computer then came into play and made uh, a huge advancement, I could run things without having to do that. Although I was still in some ways using paper tape and four millimeter DAT tape to do things. Um, and then when finally we were able to set up cron jobs, it was a lot easier to um, not have to wait. Uh, it would set it off itself and it would do something when it completed or, and the biggest advantage at that point in time of where we had been was that a debugger would finally stop at the line that failed as opposed to just telling you that the entire code failed and you'd have to figure out where it was. And when none of this mattered anymore, we thought we had reached Nirvana. Uh, 
when you're writing applications, uh, it's a little bit different on each one of the platforms. In this case, bare metal uh, application programs focused on business logic only, and you let the machine language take care of dealing with uh, all of the interaction. Um, since computing was at a minimum, the resources were like gold. You had to make sure that you used a small portion as possible of RAM and things like that. The first programming that I ever did was targeted for eight bytes. That's one character. So you can imagine. Um, if special drivers for things were involved to do the printing or storage or even the connectivity, you had to build those drivers yourself and initialize them when you were loading the programs. Otherwise, they wouldn't be considered part of it. And you had to run your code through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of debugging sessions before you ever executed in a production run. Because God help you, you didn't want to make it fail and have wasted those resources. But if the application did happen to fail, it was always because of the hardware. Moving on to the era of virtual machines and computing resources became a lot more commonplace um, in places like VMware and uh, OpenStack. Uh, they were pretty prevalent and able to be created quickly. Um, we didn't. We stopped caring about uh, coding efficiency and size and all of those things. Uh, although I contest that size continues to matter. Um, software libraries developed in C and other uh, languages became commonplace and, and took the place of actual coded sections of, of monolithic programs. And uh, the debuggers themselves started to hit on the line that failed and tell you the part of the line that needed to change and even make some uh, recommendations about how to change it. And your code always had to be recompiled for the different platforms. Uh, uh, they were all called Unix, but uh, HPUX was different than SunOS, was different than AIX, was different than IRIX, etc. So you had to have different copies that were compiled against the different platforms. Um, all of a sudden, recoverability became a very important part of things because the hardware wasn't as redundant and resilient as it could be. But if the code failed once again, you could still blame it on the hardware, which was kind of an important thing. Applications written for containers. Now we're starting to move into a whole different type of beast. Um, and in order for me to give you that kind of sensibility for containers, I have to give you some information about microservices and microservices architecture, um, give you a bit about uh, containers themselves and uh, what their formats uh, entail and uh, how they work and um, some of the major differences between containers and virtual machines. and once again, I want to talk about service decomposition at the end of that because um, you start there. And especially if you're going beyond this point with me, you'd have to um, uh, really pay attention to how you do service decomposition. Uh, recoverability, once again, becomes even more my part of the bargain as an application developer and writer. Uh, but they have self healing shift left. SRE um, uh, capabilities and policies that are now becoming a necessary part of the coding practices. Uh, unfortunately, since I have no idea where something is now running uh, on worker nodes in some kind of cluster, I can't blame the hardware anymore. But that's okay. We'll get through that one. So let's talk about microservices and microservices architectures. Uh, microservices uh, define an architecture that, that uh, 
uh, structures an application as a loosely coupled grouping of collaborative services. Um, the services uh, communicate, have inter-process protocols using things like HTTP or gRPC if they're um, um, asynchronous or, or synchronous and other things such as like Kafka or AmpIQ, uh, RabbitMQ, um, if they're not. Um, services can be developed and deployed all independently of each other. So you can have different developers deploying, managing and deploying different containers, providing different services within the same application and it still works. Um, the way that that uh, happens is by maintaining a persistent data structure uh, that can easily be coupled and decoupled uh, from each of the services. So uh, an input set data set to a container um, gets massaged and uh, an output data uh, container uh, is uh, presented to the next container uh, in the flow. And all of that data consistency that that requires is totally up to me as the um, um, uh, application developer and it uses in general an event-driven architecture to accomplish that um, and some of the mechanisms needed to ensure data consistency across all services are left up to me so why do people use microservices now as a foundation for their architecture as well um, because they're relatively small, they're pretty easy to find out what went wrong pretty quickly. And you can fix one part of it without having to mess with all of the other parts of your um, microservice services that make up an application. Um, you can deploy uh, versions of your containers and individually more frequently. So you can improve things much faster. Um, you can localize those changes so you can quickly move from something that's talking to folks in Japan from something that's talking to people in Europe. Um, pretty easy to isolate the faults because the containers themselves are, are individually isolated uh, and um, there's less of a need to commit to a particular technology stack because uh, we are becoming more and more abstracted and um, uh, distributed across this new microservices architecture. Um, the potential drawbacks of some of those things, and you'll find these as you start making the transition is Developers have to deal with some additional complexity, especially in the deployment phases of things because they're distributed and uh, service discovery becomes an important part of what goes on under the covers. And that typically involves being able to catalog the new things that are coming in or recognize things that all of a sudden show up in the clusters that run the frameworks that run your microservices. Um, this represents a lot more security concerns than uh, it used to. So you've got to pay attention to that. And as I mentioned earlier, deployment is more complex than it used to be. Um, and people tell me that it uh, requires more memory uh, in consumption than its predecessors, but I'm not convinced of that myself. This new phase of dealing with microservices um, in an event-driven environment, uh, they've dubbed serverless. And that's a misnomer, of course, because there's still physical hardware and uh, physical uh, um, application uh, capabilities involved, um, but they're only run when they're needed by the application. They don't um, have to sit there burning um, uh, cycles of computing unless they're actually in use. And there are two different types of these uh, elements. Uh, 
Um, some they call microservices and some they call functions. And I've given a brief definition of the difference between them, the function relatively small bit, um, and it performs a single act. And a typical microservice has a collection of those functions into a more uh, complex um, service that's going to be provided. Of course, we always argue about it and developers will call things one thing and call things another um, sort of interchangeably, even though there are differences. Um, and that blurs those lines, but I like to keep them separate. Uh, if you want to find out more about serverless computing and, and how it works in particular, I found that this particular article went through it very well. What is serverless? And you can go there and look to your heart's content. But I'm going to give you kind of a summary of what uh, is involved in that article. Um, in an event-driven architecture that is specifically designed uh, as a cloud-native component within a Kubernetes framework. So uh, events are going on uh, constantly, clicks of, of uh, mouses and um, uh, entries into forms and uh, copying and pasting and all of those things. Um, and there are queues that are made available for each one of those events to be captured. Each one of those events then are presented to a mediator that's actually taking one at a time in the sequence that they came in. And it's presenting the, the events individually to all of the channels that are registered with the mediator. And it asks the consumer of that channel, do you, are you responsible for this event? Are you responsible? And generally they'll say no, and one will say yes. And when that happens, that event consumer picks up the event and processes it through its microservice that's uh, been created within it. And if it changes the datagram that went into it and came out of it, it then passes it on as a new event and this whole process starts again. However, if it doesn't, that's the end of the process. It finishes it and it moves on to the, uh, the mediator moves on to the next event in the queue. So some of the benefits and drawbacks of this kind of approach to uh, application development for cloud native environments is that it's very resilient. Uh, you can find alternates that you can move to quickly if one um, um, parameter isn't uh, met within the application service itself. Um, you can scale the individual parts of it in the mediation, in the consumers, in the uh, event, uh, you know, capture uh, instead of uh, scaling the whole thing. So you save resources. Uh, you can update features much more rapidly. Once again, that's based on the microservices and the containers being somewhat isolated. And it's very flexible for developers to add new things and use different languages, uh, starting from the older languages like C, and, and Pascal and things like that, going all the way up to the newer languages like Golang and Ballerina, etc. One of the bad parts of using a serverless microservice is because there are no standards for each one of the uh, providers. Um, each one has developed their own set of functions and microservices, and they're different on each one of the public cloud platforms, for example. So if you deal with AWS versus uh, Microsoft, uh, Azure versus GCE uh, or GKE, you've uh, got to deal with different libraries and rewrite your applications to accommodate them. Uh, so that can be problematic, as problematic as it was to recompile my code to run on HPUX and SunOS. Now, 
it's an old school kind of philosophy, but I think it's still very important. Um, in order to obtain this and to move from the mainframe bare metal virtual machine uh, containerized uh, microservice uh, serverless delivery, you need to be able to decompose your application services into these very discrete uh, parts that can be loosely coupled once again, as we started with. Um, and a lot of people don't have experience doing that. So I'm gonna give you my impressions of the things that have worked for me when I've done it. Um, you decompose by business capabilities, for example, uh, you define a corresponding business capability as a separate component of your thing, and it ends up being the list of microservices that satisfy that component. Uh, or you decompose by the domain-driven stuff within your design subdomain. So uh, application subdomains uh, within the domains are contained within the individual microservices and containers. Um, or you can do it more of a, a quick and dirty way by just taking advantage of the verbs in your applications, the, the do factor, and define those services as individual uh, uh, microservices and, and uh, functions that are responsible for fulfilling that specific action and that becomes a decomposed uh, component. Or you can take the nouns or resources like objects. Um, and most object oriented folks are familiar with that one. I personally like to use the decomposition uh, verbs and nouns and resources so that I can apply human language to describing them to people. They don't have to be dealt with as if they're a computer programmer if you take that approach. Okay. Effectively decomposing um, services so that they fit in the new cloud native realm is only a, you know, each one, each service, small set of responsibilities follow the single responsibility principle. You can look that one up in most uh, computer uh, science books and uh, uh, you can get a complete description of it. Um, but really what you're doing is following the Unix utilities of, uh, policy that each one of the utilities like Graph and Awk, et cetera, does one thing, it does it very well. It doesn't do those things multiply. You have to put them together to accomplish that. Um, make sure that everything is loosely coupled. Don't tie anything to any dependency with any other, um, uh, aspect of your application service or uh, microservice. If you do that, you defeat the purpose. Um, and once again, each of the services that you're creating has an input datagram and an output datagram. And uh, if uh, the datagram is changed by the uh, service uh, being published, it has to have some impact to the next event that happens. Otherwise, it goes to the next set of events. Um, other services that consume that event update their data based on what happened with the datagram as it went through the service in advance of itself. And that's what they call the event-driven architecture. A lot of people ask me about whether the microservices architecture is any better than any of the other um, methodologies for architecting application services. And although I'd love to give you an exact answer, I'm going to give you a rather uh, funky one that's not quite um, appealing to everyone. It depends. So um, if you've uh, broken things down well enough to satisfy your needs for virtual machine hosting from bare metal hosting or from mainframe hosting to bare metal to virtual machine. Um, then you have to ask yourself whether it's important to move to uh, containerization and which will require another uh, set of 
decomposition. Everything that you do from layer to layer to layer adds complexity and you need to have more expertise in the various uh, requirements at each one of the layers uh, for you know virtual bare metal virtual machine and uh, containerized microservice delivery for cloud native and those you need to know what you're doing to actually move there um, networking um, it's a whole new layer of complexity that's added onto it because there's so much more that the networks uh, between things rely um, on within the containers. And um, if you're not adding value in terms of creating each one of them, then why go to the additional complexity? That's my question. If you keep asking that and the answer is yes, keep moving on this course. If not, you can stop. Okay, let's talk about the platforms themselves, bare metal versus virtual machines versus containers versus that category of who cares. And I'm almost getting to the point where I can tell you what who cares means. Okay. So here's a depiction basically of those three different architectures and how they look. Um, you've got the physical infrastructure layer at the bottom on bare metal. There's a host operating system and applications run on top of it. It's a single individual sort of monolithic um, uh, thing that the applications are sitting in. Um, if you move to virtual machines you've got the same physical infrastructure sitting underlying it and there is a host operating system but now we've introduced an interceding hypervisor in which it can emulate different guest operating systems sitting in their own namespaces with their own ram and their own uh, allocations of physical pieces of the hardware at the at the lower end Finally, from a containerization standpoint, you do have the physical infrastructure and the host operating system as we originally had. Um, layered on top of that is an engine. In this case, I'm saying it's the Docker engine, but um, um, K-Zeros is another version of that that uh, Mirantis happens to produce. And within that, engine applications can be run in separate containers but they're still using the same operating system um, they're just uh, taking advantage of connections to it uh, via custom resource definitions and things like that so that's basic differences between the three the bare metal world um, presents some benefits over some of the others. Um, if you have workloads that demand the full computing capabilities of the physical hardware, put it on bare metal. Um, if it requires specialized hardware, in most cases, um, you know, they can virtualize some of them now, like GPUs and, um, uh, you know, smart cards and things like that. Um, but as this physical specialized hardware progresses, some of them won't be able to be sliced off and you'll have to use the full, full physical infrastructure to uh, accommodate them on the, on the back plane. Um, if you host on bare metal, no noisy neighbor syndrome, um, and there's fewer moving parts. Uh, if something breaks, you know where to look for it. And networking is much less complex because if I've plugged in the RJ45 uh, uh, plug and the light comes on, I'm pretty sure I've got connectivity. In virtual machines, um, this is where that uh, service decomposition stuff starts to take into effect because uh, you can split things up uh, across multiple virtual machines uh, in very different operating systems. Uh, 
um, when you host these virtual machines on bare metal, you can increase the uh, utilization of those physical resources a lot. On bare metal, typically, there's only about 30% of the physical hardware that actually gets used at any point in time. Uh, on virtual machines, you can push that up to 70 or 80%. Um, it, in this emulation mode of the hypervisor, uh, you can emulate the use of things like uh, NIC cards and uh, uh, GPUs and all kinds of other things. So you can make more effective use of the physical hardware that you have. Um, that hypervisor usually has a machine monitor that's into it that allows you to create and run the virtual machines themselves. And they create a buffer, the hypervisor creates a buffer between the operating system and each one of the virtual machines so you can manipulate stuff in between them. And um, the virtual machines themselves run in their own namespaces and have their own operating systems associated to them. So you can have Windows and Linux and Unix platforms running on the same physical machine. Um, and they can be run at the same uh, on the same physical server without uh, interfering with each other, which is kind of fun. Okay, some of the benefits for those virtual machines um, is the hardware being virtualized to run multiple operating system instances. Uh, if you need that to run your applications, it's a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, consolidates the multiple applications into a single system because you can host all the virtual machines there. Um, cost savings is there's a reduced footprint of physical hardware uh, to host your application services and you can provision them faster because the physical hypervisor operating system is already running. So you're just uh, putting a definition on top of that of the virtual machine. Um, and the increased utilization, as I indicated earlier, up to 70%. Okay, if you've stayed with me this far and you want to deal with dealing with the containerization because you think the complexity is worth it, um, you can run this sort of software uh, in a cloud native way predictably and it'll run from server to server as you move it or virtual machine to virtual machine as you move it in pretty much the same way. And it provides a way of running the, uh, the isolated systems on a single host. So each one of the services can be run and isolated uh, on the single server host. Typically there's a framework uh, that's associated with that and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the engine, you know, either Docker or k zeros uh, or whatever engine you happen to be running is just running on top of the host OS. And it's not really a hypervisor in that way, but it has properties like a hypervisor. Uh, it, the difference in that and a virtual machine, obviously, is the operating system kernel, which is shared in a, a containerized environment and not shared in a virtual machine environment. But because the containers are really lightweight um, and, and, and tiny in terms of what their uh, need, uh, resources they need, um, they start up in seconds versus minutes to boot an operating system sitting in a virtual machine. That's a big plus for recoverability and things like that. And these containers have specific benefits over and above the virtualized or the bare metal world. Um, you can pack a lot more onto an application, whereas you might be able to pack 20 or so virtual machines onto a physical host. You can do 200, 2000 containers on that same host. Um, and, you know, you can share things um, much more easily in both the public and private cloud uh, world by doing it. And it'll uh, allow you to share resources across those two together in, you know, um, hyper um, cluster uh, worlds. 
You can also uh, accelerate development because of the quick packaging and testing and um, application development. And it's a whole new realm of CICD uh, capabilities that, um, that move to Agile, basically. And um, since they all share that single operating system, you're only maintaining one versus maintaining the virtual machine operating systems and that sort of thing. So it makes it easier to do the care and feeding. Okay, we finally get to the who cares. Um, if you've taken the time to move off of the mainframes to bare metal to virtual machines and the applications have been decomposed and uh, placed in containers, instead of having a single location where you can run them in the boundaries of either the bare metal or the virtual machine or that sort of thing. What if all of the containers were placed into a secured registry and that secured registry was only accessible by your organization? And uh, if encoding is needed, the containerized service for encoding would be drawn from the catalog of discovered uh, services within your application service and would simply be allowed to do the encoding for you versus having to write it into the application. And <clears throat> then if you don't need to worry about uh, where things are running or how things are running, um, you're able to scale. Um, much more rapidly across multiple platform types at the same time. Um, you can do it across the servers. You can do it um, to scale more easily. You can do it to increase the network bandwidth um, all within the application services themselves. Um, so, so far, what I've described is sort of like the promise of quote, what they call serverless computing. But in a serverless computing realm, the downfall, as I pointed out earlier, is that it results in vendor lock-in. The one from AWS is different than the one from Azure, is different than the one from GKE. So you get locked into one, basically. What if instead of relying on the um, vendor provided um, uh, orchestration capabilities for serverless, we hosted everything in a Kubernetes infrastructure that was running in all of those environments. Now we don't need to really deal with vendor lock-in um, that the framework itself is the one seeking in its uh, service discovery where the containers are, what they are used to do, like encoding or like increasing network bandwidth or those kinds of things. Um, people are now becoming familiar with the containerized world and the Kubernetes framework is now becoming the most popular. So you can reuse your existing uh, uh, skill sets. You don't have to develop a whole lot of new ones. Um, Multi-cluster environments become possible across multiple infrastructures that happen to be on-prem or um, in the quote cloud, as people say, uh, can even create environments and resources which are shared among the private and public and um, allow the developers to place it where they think it runs best. Um, and here's where I want to introduce this idea of a service mesh, which layers over the top of your multi-cluster environment. Um, the one that I like to use to accomplish those kind of things is Istio, but there are others out there, such as Kong or uh, Superglue or, or those. And they'll provide a quality of service and security capability 
across all of the networking that in, is involved to can interconnect all of those environments. And if you take me one step further in this thinking about who cares and uh, deciding on a standardized platform, uh, what if we built the intelligence um, into the provisioning of the containers and deployment of containers and things like that into a neural network that is sitting inside of the service mesh that's presented to all of these different clusters across all of these different platforms. And it seeks in the trusted uh, secured registry those things that it needs. Algorithms could be uh, presented to scale up and down as required across multiple infrastructure types, um, minimize the cost of maintaining the infrastructure and maximize its performance because now you can take advantage of it across all of them where it runs best. Instead of running things in individual servers, we introduce the idea of TPM, trusted computing, and we uh, ensure that only computers, the physical uh, hosts that have trusted computing that represent my organization are part of this clustered environment across multiple platforms. And then all of the images in the trusted registry can be instantiated on whatever physical hosts they need to be under the control of the uh, orchestrator, Kubernetes, uh, using the TPM technology to be able to ensure that it's uh, risk, uh, you know, minimizes risk um, and it can distribute it uh, with that risk mitigated. What will have to happen to accomplish this obviously is standardization and a security model that works for everybody. Um, and this is something that the industry needs to work on, in my opinion, to continue a harmonious uh, uh, condition where all of the flavors of infrastructure and containers and virtual machines and bare metals can uh, live uh, together in a secured way. All right, a little bit of light reading for you guys to finish off on. If you think that you like this kind of approach and like to read a little more on it, um, there's a blog out there at the link that I've shared that hopefully will give you more additional information. And then finally, from my company, Marantis, I wanted to sort of give you uh, an idea of some freeware uh, thing that's available for you called Lens that will help you or, uh, manage these orchestration engines across multiple clusters uh, as a developer and to be able to allow you to put things in one place or another or another, uh, depending on how you believe it will run best in your application service or cheapest or uh, you know faster, better, cheaper. This is a way of allowing you to decide which one of those to put them in because it will manage things on-prem, in cloud, et cetera, all in the same way. And I'm told that there will be some kind of question and answer sessions at the end of it. So I'm putting this slide in to represent that. And if uh, you seem to think that there's something here that uh, uh, makes sense for you, uh, and, or didn't make sense for you, please feel free to give me a, a shout out on, on uh, email. My email address is bmatthews, B-M-A-T-H-E-W-S at marantis.com. Please feel free. That's what I'm here for. Thank you all very much. And I hope you have a happy gobbler uh, on the 25th of November. Take care. Be socially distant, wash your hands, and wear a mask. <laughs>